Now I want you to turn with me to Mark, the 13th chapter. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take ye heed, watch and pray, for you know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants, and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch you therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. There are five things that I want you to see about the coming again of Jesus Christ. The first one is watch. Second, wait. Third, walk. Fourth, work. Fifth, wake up. Now the first word that we find here is watch. Take ye heed, watch and pray. Watch ye therefore, he said. Four times Jesus uses the word watch in this chapter. Now the word watch carries with it the idea that we're scanning the horizon. We're studying our Bibles. We're exploring current events. We're watching the television news. We are reading our newspapers. We're listening to the radio news. And we, are, we keep monitoring possible events that relate to the events that Jesus left us in these three chapters. Jesus said we're to watch. We're to watch an unfolding scenario which would match current events in the world which he predicted would precede his return. He said in Matthew 16, discern the signs of the times. He said, read the signs. He said, they'll be all about you before I return. And we're asking ourselves today as Christians, are things beginning to get into focus? Throw the eternal telescope, the telescope of prophecy that Jesus left us. Things which indicate Christ's coming again and the end of the age. He said, when these things begin, he didn't say when they're accomplished, when they're finished. He said, when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draws nigh. Now Jesus defined these things that we're to watch for. The first thing he listed was the possibility of global war. He said, watch for that sign. He said there will be, he indicated there'll be weapons dangling man over the precipice of human annihilation. He said, you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, for nations shall rise against nation and kingdoms against kingdom. And he said, except the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh could be saved. Now, what other period of history has there ever been when man had the capability of destroying the entire world and no flesh would be left unless we had divine intervention? Our newspapers are filled with it. They're filled with, and, and our news magazines and our television commentators are talking now about genocide of the human race with the new and powerful weapons that are being developed in many parts of the world. And then the second thing Jesus said to watch for, he said, watch for famines. Note that he doesn't say that these famines are going to be everywhere. He says in divers places, meaning various places, and the people that are starving to death. In 1981, as compared to 1971, we're told by the United Nations that six times more human beings will starve to death. In other words, we're losing the battle to feed the world. The London Sunday Times warned the other day that the world grain reserves are at a perilous low. And then thirdly, at the same, in the same verse, Jesus said we're to watch for earthquakes in divers places. 
We've had several earthquakes here in California just this week. Jesus said it's a call to look up, for your redemption draws nigh. Since 1976, more people on earth have been killed in earthquakes than during the whole previous 75 years of this century. And that includes the earthquake here in San Francisco area in 1906. And then he said, watch for pestilences. I don't have to tell people in Santa Clara County <laughs> about pestilences. You've had a pest here recently. I said recently, you notice, I think they're gone. But Ann Landers gave a long column this week to the current VD epidemic of herpes simplex 2, for which there is no known cure of venereal disease. The scripture says there will be pestilences like that, and there'll be insect infestations throughout the world. There was a cover story on either Time or Newsweek last year entitled, The Insects Are Coming. And the story indicated there's going to be a battle to see who wins. Whether the human beings win or the insects win the world first. And then sixthly, Jesus said, watch the Middle East for political developments. He picked up on what the Old Testament Hebrew prophets promised so uh, promised so frequently the return of the Jews to restore their homeland and Jesus said learn a parable of the fig tree when her branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves ye know that summer is near so ye in like manner when ye shall see these things come to pass know that it's nigh even at the doors the fig tree has always been a symbol of Israel Watch the Middle East. History began there. And someday history will conclude there. And the Bible tells us in graphic detail some of the events that are going to take place in that day. And so much of it is going to be centered in the Middle East. And where are our headlines coming from and have been for the past few years? The Middle East. Those countries where civilization began right where the Tigris and the Euphrates River are, where Abraham came from, from Ur of the Chaldees, right there's where the war between Iran and Iraq is taking place right now, the Persian Gulf area. Watch the Middle East. Jesus said, watch, for when this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations, then shall the end come. Now, this may not be yet fulfilled, but we're very close to it. I don't think there's anywhere in the world you couldn't hear the gospel today by radio. And with these new developments in television, it won't be long until you'll be able to see the gospel preached by television. And think of the things that are going to take place in the next 10 years, if we live that long and getting the gospel to the whole world is one of the purposes of our ministry. Now, Jesus said, watch. He also said, wait. Wait for his coming. Paul defined a Christian as someone who has turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven. To wait for his son from heaven. Hebrews 10:37 quotes from this same passage and said, Yet for a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Matthew Henry once said that though he tarry beyond our time, he will not tarry past the due time. George Washington once remarked that his cook never asked when the company or whether the company has come but whether the hour has come. Jesus said there would come a time when the Son of God would pronounce, the hour has come. And that would signal his return. And then the third thing out of this chapter would be walk straight, Mark 13, and let him that is in the field not turn back again for to take up his garment. Don't turn back, he exhorted. 
A university student who was a star football player came forward in one of our crusades and he was asked why he was giving his life to Christ and he replied, I got tired of playing the game without being able to see the goalpost. And Christ's second coming gives us a goal in life. It's one that's worth waiting for and working for. Jesus said somewhere else, I think Luke 9, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Don't look back. You've started. Jesus Christ died on the cross because he loved you. He rose again. He's now at the right hand of God the Father preparing for your coming, for his coming, for you. And the dead in Christ shall rise. And then we which remain alive shall be caught up together in the air to be with the Lord. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. To the Romans, Paul wrote, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. So let us walk honestly, he said, as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in strife and envy, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. In other words, the hope of the coming of Christ ought to make us walk as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, living godly and sober lives. Yes. When you believe that Christ is coming back, it affects your daily living, your daily walk. Jesus himself provided the supreme example of how a person is to live in view of that great day that is yet to come. He said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. G. Camel Morgan was one of the greatest Bible teachers of the early part of this century in England. And he made this statement. He said, to me, the second coming is the perpetual light on the path which makes the present bearable. I never lay my head on the pillow without thinking that perhaps before I wake, the final morning will have dawned. I never begin my work without thinking that he may interrupt it and begin his own. And then fifthly and lastly, Jesus is saying to those who are asleep, wake up, wake up. This past week, there was in the papers, the 23-year-old man whose job for a catering company was to open and close the access gate to an international airport at midnight on Tuesday. He was asleep in the roadway. And rather than awake at the gate, he was run over by a truck and killed. Are you at God's gate of grace right now, awake and alert to the events that are going to transpire? Or are you asleep on life's roadway and about to be crushed forever as the truck of eternity rolls over you? Take ye heed, says Jesus. In fact, four different times in this chapter, Jesus exhorts us to take heed. In verses 2, 9, 23, and 33. Take heed. For ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. Are you asleep? Or are you awake? I'm going to ask you to wake up this afternoon.